Good morning. My name is Samah Norquist. I serve on the Board of Advisors of the Notre Dame Religious Liberty Initiative. I'm excited to be moderating this panel that will highlight yet another story of communities of faith and their houses of worship being systematically targeted by government regimes as we speak. Almost every community in the world faced <coughs> discrimination, harassment, repression, and of course, genocide and persecution. The ability to freely carry out one's faith is a gift from God and a universal human right. For the United States of America, advancing and protecting religious liberty around the world is now a national security imperative. Nations can prosper, achieve stability, only when they have pluralistic societies where the freedom of conscience of its citizen is protected and its citizens are allowed to be free and equal to participate in every way. In his remarks, in his welcoming remarks at the second summit in Rome in 2022, Dean Cole reminded us that, quote, people of faith are the face victims of repressive government practices. I don't know about you all, but you really need, he gives really good quotes. We have four great speakers today to address the challenges of religious freedom in Ukraine. Since Russia invaded Ukraine in 2022, churches have been under attack by Russian rockets and drones. Faith leaders have been arrested, beaten, jailed, and the religious freedom of all their, its faith communities have been repressed, oppressed. It is the same story once again, yet in another part of the world. With that, I will start with our panel uh, and ladies first. So we'll go with Professor Elizabeth Clark. Professor Elizabeth Clark is an associate director of the International Center for Law and Religion, Stud and Religion Studies at Brigham Young University and the US member of the OSCE ODIHR advisory panel for the freedom of religion or belief. Professor Clark has written extensively on religious freedom, particularly in Eastern Europe. And her works include authoring and or editing the books, the books religion during the Russian Ukraine, Ukrainian conflict, religion and law in the United States. Facilitating Freedom of Religion or Belief, a Desk Book and Law and Religion in the Post-Communist Europe. Professor Clark has analyzed legislation and draft re re legislation on religion from over a dozen countries for the United States uh, State Department, USAID, national governments, and international NGOs. She has spoken at the UN and OSCE forums at an over 100 academic conferences throughout the world. She has also testified before the US Congress and the US Commission on International Religious Freedom. With that, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. I appreciate the chance to be here. And I'm grateful to Notre Dame's Religious Liberty Initiative and the amazing work they're doing here. Um, I want to start by paying tribute to the heroic people of Ukraine and those who supported them, including those in this room, when their response to completely unjustified attacks on their territorial integrity. In my remarks today, I'm going to focus on two significant challenges facing the country of Ukraine, how to survive as a nation and how to protect religious freedom and religious pluralism. Now these two are often posed as being in tension and they do seem to be in tension at first, but I also argue that they also overlap and are mutually reinforcing. That is to say that maintaining a stable, independent, democratic regime in Ukraine requires strong protections of religious freedom. So let me start with the tension. 
Um, as was mentioned in the introduction, challenges to the Ukraine's democratic order started in 2014 with annexation of Donbass and in Crimea. Um, the Russian world rhetoric has been used to justify the war and attempt to erase Ukraine as a state. Um, the religion comes into this as, as the Russian Orthodox Church has supported justification of the war, recently declaring it a holy war. Um, the use of religion to support the war's rationale and concerns about having Ukraine's, um, at that point, majority church subordinate to the Moscow Patriarchy of the Russian Orthodox Church led the Ukrainian government to support creation of a new Orthodox Church that was established under the authority of the Ecumenical Patriarchate in Constantinople, Istanbul, in 2018. Um, now, if you're not familiar with the situation in Ukraine, this gets very confusing very quickly um, because the old Orthodox Church that had historical, cultural, and ecclesiastical ties to Russia is the, or, is the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, the UOC, and the new one is the Orthodox Church of Ukraine, or the OCU. Um, I'll keep you on your toes today. Since the creation of the Orthodox Church of Ukraine, the OCU, the government, however, has been engaged in activities that line up to be overt religious discrimination against the Ukrainian Orthodox Church. Even though the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, the one that has historical cultural ties, has declared its independence from the Russian Orthodox Church. Now, to be fair, it's not clear, as I understand it, in Orthodox theology what declaring its independence means. Um, the Russian Orthodox Church doesn't believe it's independent. So, but that's an internal theological issue. Um, but because of those connections um, and the Russian Orthodox Church's role in promoting the, um, the Russian world narrative, the Ukrainian Orthodox, the government of Ukraine has taken a number of steps that favor the Orthodox Church of Ukraine. So this includes, um, in the early days, bans on UOC priests serving as chaplains, or requiring that if they have ties to Russia that they disclose that in their name, um, or that the government can change the um, rules about, internal church rules about when a congregation can switch from one religion to another religion. Um, I mean, these are, on their face, straightforward violations of autonomy rights for religions to determine their own name, their own rules about governance, um, and straightforward religious discrimination. Since the unprovoked full-scale invasion in 2022, the discrimination against the Orthodox Church of Ukraine Ukrainian Orthodox Church, has become more widespread, such as evicting the UOC from leases to run the most sacred monastery complex in Ukraine, um, selective prosecution for Ukrainian Orthodox priests for religious hatred, even though there are many harsh statements by both UOC and OCU priests. Um, USC priests have been prosecuted for treason and religious hatred in some cases merely for criticizing the canonicity of the newer Orthodox Church of Ukraine. Um, and last but certainly not least is the government supported draft law that would ban religions related to centers of power in the enemy state, that is to say, the, Orth the Ukrainian Orthodox Church. Um, so this has passed the first reading in Parliament. So far, it doesn't have the votes to go further, but it has the support of the government. So no, I'm happy to go into more detail during question and answer about why these actions fail the European and the international norm standard of being prescribed by law, proportionate, necessary in a democratic society. It's sort of the threshold. Um, and certainly arguments can be made, but let me give you just one example. Um, even including all forms of convictions, including those simply for criticizing other churches, there's only been about 80 criminal cases against Ukrainian Orthodox Church priests. priests. 
and only about 40 of them have been convicted. Uh, much of the discussion turns on the fact that this is an unloyal church, that this is a church that is opposed to the interests of the Ukraine. But in terms of actual proof, there's been 80 cases and 40 convictions. Um, this is, of course, worrisome, and of course something that needs to be addressed and prosecuted. But the, when you look at proportionate, necessary, and prescribed by law, the conviction of 40 priests out of 10,000 um, suggests that maybe it's not necessary to shut down the entire organization, that there are less harsh ways to be able to address the same problem. So this has led to concerns and criticism from the UN High Commission on Human Rights, who also noted that there's no uh, legally admissible evidence that the Russian Orthodox Church is leading or guiding the Ukrainian Orthodox Church as an institution to commit crimes, or the crimes that have been committed were committed on behalf of the organization. So you see the tension, right? Efforts to maintain the territorial integrity of the Ukrainian state, to fight the Russian world narrative um, that's insidious and false, and also trying to keep the commitments that Ukraine has made to uphold freedom of religion or belief. I know many people of very good will who see this tension and justify the restrictions because of the pr clearly pressing need to support the territorial integrity of the country. But my argument today is that that's not the whole story. Um, preserving religious freedom and maintaining independence are also overlapping goals. And let me just give two quick examples. So, as problematic as violations of religious freedom are in Ukraine, they are nowhere near as the order of the violations of religious freedom in the conquered regions. Um, in as early as um, 2014, 2016, there were documented appropriation of property, exiling, disappearances, and torture of leaders of minority churches, persecution of the new Ukrainian Orthodox Church of Ukraine, um, and even persecution of the older Ukrainian Orthodox Church when those priests refused to be integrated into the Russian Orthodox Church. I've heard firsthand from survivors of imprisonment and torture, and it's horrific and heartbreaking. Um, and so as Ukraine reconquers its own territories, it's able to return a higher level of religious freedom to those areas and prevents additional gross violations of religious freedom. Um, so that's one point. Another point of overlap. Ukraine's war success is related to its continued support from European countries in the US. Um, Ukraine has commanded great support internationally, quite fairly, because it was an innocent victim of Russian aggression. But now penalizing an entire church for its organizational or ecclesiastical or historical ties with Russia and the wrongs committed by a small faction of its leaders loses the moral high ground. Finally, on the mutually reinforcing, maintaining religious freedom and territorial integrity are, can be mutually reinforcing goals. The Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, the OSCE, has developed important policy guidance about this, and they works through sort of why freedom of religion and belief and national security are, in its words, complementary, interdependent, and mutually reinforcing objects that can and must be advanced together. And frankly, this is, goes to why religious freedom matters, why we're here, that religious freedom promotes the common good, even when it's difficult, even when it's for people you deeply disagree with, who you think are insidious and morally harmful. Um, there's been great work done on this. Um, Brian Grimm, who's on the advisory board here, has done sort of classic work in his book, Price of Freedom Denied, on the correlations between religious freedom and national security. Others, Nila Isaia, did an excellent account um, studying of every, every terror attack in the world from 1990 to 2014. And the countries with high levels of religious res freedom restrictions, the most problematic countries, experienced nearly 25 times as many attacks as countries with low levels of restrictions who experienced an absence of religious terrorism 99% of the time. 
religious freedom works. Um, now you may be thinking, well, what about religious, religious organizations that do harm? What about a criminal organization or one that promotes seditious ideas? Shouldn't it be banned? And yes, this is a possibility under international law, but it's a last resort, and only to the extent that it's prescribed by law, proportionate and necessary in a democratic society. The OSC and others have explicitly stated that wrongdoings on the parts of individuals should be addressed through criminal, administrative, or civil procedures. 20 second. Thank you, against that person, instead of against the religious belief community as a whole. They say the temptation to erode the right of religious freedom is universal during wartime. It happened in the United States. We discriminated against um, Buddhist Japanese Americans, but not Christian Japanese Americans. Um, but the case supporting that, Korematsu, is now universally reviled as one of the worst cases in the United States Supreme Court. So I'll close saying my conviction that protecting freedom of religion and belief and preserving the territorial <coughs> integrity of Ukraine are not only overlapping goals, but in the end are mutually reinforcing. Thank you. So I know how important it is to be blessed by a clergy. So I'm going to go to the Metropolitan uh, next, uh, and then we'll go back to Metropolitan Yevstrif. Yevstrati. That's it. Zoria. Uh, of Bella Tserkiva was born on October 21, 1977. By nationality, he's Ukrainian. After completing his study at the Kiev Orthodox Theological Academy in 2001 to this time, he is a lecturer at, the acad at this academy. In August 2018, he was conferred the scientific title of Professor of the Coda. In 1998, he was tonsured in monoticism with the name, can you say? <laughs> yes, Strati. That's it and was ordained as deacon. Pardon me, I really don't do well with names. Uh, in 2000, he was ordained as priest, and in 2008, as bishop. On November 2002, he was appointed as the press secretary of the Kiev Patriarchate, <coughs> and now he still is a, spokesperson, a spokesman for the Kiev Metropolia of the Orthodox Church of Ukraine. Since March 2005, he's a member of the Secretariat of the Ukrainian Council of Churches and Religious Organizations as representative of the Orthodox Church of Ukraine. Since March 2019, he has served as the deputy head of the Department for External Church Relations of the Orthodox Church of Ukraine. In February 2023, he was elected to be ruling hierarch of the newly created eparchy of Bela Tserkva of Kiev region and elevated to the rank of, of metropolitan. The floor is yours, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, participants of this meeting. I thank you for the invitation and for the opportunity to speak before such an esteemed audience. Before starting, I want to ask you once again to remember in your prayers and in your thoughts the victims of Russian aggression against Ukraine. As I was in the air over the Atlantic to join you here, Russia launched yet another missile attack on Kyiv. Among the damaged targets were three hospitals, one Russian missile scoring a direct hit on Ukraine's main children's hospital, the Ohmadit. You have probably seen reports on this. One more Russian crime. So now I am here with you in body, but a part of my heart and attention remains in Ukraine, where Russia continues to kill Ukrainians every day <coughs> just because we want to be who we are. Thank you. Let me return to the topic of our panel. Ukraine is a traditionally multi-religious country. The majority of Ukrainians, more than 70 percent, 
identify themselves as Orthodox Christians. According to independent sociological surveys, a little more than half of Ukrainians identify themselves with the independent Orthodox Church of Ukraine, which I represent, but no one religious group is completely dominant. In Ukraine, in it is common that one church represents the vast majority in one region and be a minority in another. It should also be emphasized how Muslim and Jewish groups in Ukraine have historical roots going back centuries or more. This has created an almost unique atmosphere <coughs> that promotes practical inter-Christian and inter-religious cooperation. Today, this is most visibly embodied in the Ukrainian Council of Churches and Religious Organizations, a non-governmental union comprising 17 religious associations that have been working together for almost 30 years on the basis of voluntarily participation, equality, and consensus decision-making. Ukraine as a country enjoys a high level of religious freedom and maintains internal interconfessional peace. All religious communities, Christians, Muslim, Jewish, and others openly, repeatedly, and publicly emphasize that the existence of an independent, sovereign, democratic Ukraine is a guarantee of their rights to freedom of religion. We know this from our experience of three decades of existence of our restored independent state. At the same time, Russian aggression and occupation of more than 20% of Ukraine has created a state where the situation in the territories of Ukraine controlled by Russia radically different from that in the territories controlled by the Ukrainian government, where the rule of law applies and legal mechanisms operate. In the free territories, freedom of religion is a reality protected by law. On the occupied territories, freedom of religion does not exist. In occupied territories, Ukrainian religious organizations are simply labeled by the Russian occupation authorities as disloyal and are subjected to persecution and restrictions, up to and including a complete ban <coughs> of their activities. The Russian authorities persecute communities and activists of the Orthodox Church of Ukraine, the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church, Protestant Evangelical Churches, and Muslim organizations. Multiply Jewish and Mormon communities have completely evacuated from parts of the occupied territories. In the occupied territories, the Russian authorities require all communities to register under Russian law, and without such registration, all activities are completely prohibited. Russia forces the population of the occupied territories to accept Russian citizenship. Without a Russian passport, Ukrainian citizens in the occupied territories are effectively without rights. They cannot even move freely priests, pastors, and community activists whom the Russian authorities consider to be connected with Ukraine are subject to various types of persecution. They are called in for questioning, arrested, imprisoned, deported, tortured, and even killed. In February of this year, in the occupied territory of the Kherson region, the occupiers took Stepan Podolchak a priest of the Orthodox Church of Ukraine from the village of Kalanchak in for questioning, killed him, and then phoned his wife to come and collect his body. On November 16, 2022, Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church priests Ivan Levitsky and Bogdan Geleta were arrested in occupied Berdyansk. For almost two years, nothing was known about their condition or place of detention. Only on June 28th of this year were they released through an exchange mechanism mediated by Pope Francis. On sep September 2023, priests of the Orthodox Church of Ukraine, Andriy Chuy and Christopher Hrimli, 
were arrested in occupied Donetsk territory. They were held in prison in, Ru in Russian Rostov on charges of pro-Ukrainian activities and then deported to Georgia this spring. The Ukrainian non-governmental organization Institute of Religious Freedom together with religious associations and human rights defenders monitors Russian crimes against freedom of conscience. On the irf.in.ua website, you can find English publications including data from their third report of the impact of Russian aggression on the religious communities of Ukraine in these two and a half years. One of the key issues regarding the state of religious freedom in Ukraine now is the issue of self-guarding that the protections provided to genuine religious communities in Ukraine are not misused by the Russian state as the tools for their hybrid aggression. The ideology of Ruski Mir, Russian world, which reassembles aggressive jihadism, officially declares Russian aggression against Ukraine a holy war and denies as a matter of faith the very existence of a unique Ukrainian nation and its right to have an independent state. Not only the Russian Orthodox Church, but all the main religious associations in Russia have now become a tool of spreading elements of this ideology through Orthodox, Protestant, Muslim and Jewish structures. It should be emphasized that, first of all, the Moscow Patriarchy, but also other religious centers in Russia, do not simply cooperate with the Kremlin regime. They are fully integrated into the state system, are parts of the Kremlin policy apparatus. So, when we talk about Russia, we must understand that the system of state control over, over religion, which existed during communist rule, has been completely restored and even strengthened. Strengthened because in days, today's ideology of the Kremlin, reference to religious values fulfills the role that the ideology of communism played in the Soviet era. Ukraine is, not, is now forced to defend itself against the Russian hybrid aggression, to defend its freedom and its very existence. And that is why the parliament must complete consideration and implementation of laws that will preclude Russian religious centers, which are actually organs of the Russian government, from having under their command religious organizations registered under Ukrainian law. The proposed laws do not and cannot ban religious activity as Russian propaganda shoots. They do not and cannot limit freedom of conscience. Their goals are to protect Ukrainian religious communities and to ensure that the privileges afforded registered religious bodies cannot be co-opted for use in the interest of the Kremlin. An organization actively working to overthrow the government should not be able to simultaneously enjoy the privileges afforded to it by the government. This is true for religious organizations as much as any other. The draft law further provides for a multi-stage legal review mechanism which the with the participation of independent academic experts before and religious organization is deregistered and with right of appeal to course of law. This is a completely democratic mechanism, one which every single major Ukrainian religious association with the sole exception, exception of the structure subordinate to the Moscow Patriarchate, publicly supports freedom of religion is not the same as being free to hide criminal activity under religious garb and religious rhetoric. This is important to understand. 
Freedom of speech does not mean that those who use their voice to instigate violence or murder cannot face consequences. Freedom of enterprise does not mean that we allow corporations to pollute or destroy at will. We accept it as the right and duty of societies to regulate their freedoms. Ukraine and the Ukrainian religious community are now at the forefront of the struggle for freedom. We know the price of freedom, including freedom of re religious freedom. We require support in this struggle, and we thank all people of goodwill who take the time to look behind the rhetoric, to understand, and to aid. Thank you. Thank you, Your Eminence. Next, we have Dr. Anatoly Babinski. Did Babinski. I? Babinski. See, I, I got it. Uh, Dr. Babinski has a PhD in church history uh, from the Ukrainian Catholic University. Field of expertise is history of the Catholic Church in the 20th century and the history of the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church in the 19th to 20th century. Since 2018, he has been a fellow at the Metropolitan Andrei Chepitsky Institute of Eastern Christian Studies at St. Michael's College of the University of Toronto in Canada. Since 2020, he has been a research fellow at the Institute of Church History at, Ukra at the Ukrainian Catholic University. And since 2021, he served as a lecturer as well as later uh, as a po postdoctoral fellow at the Faculty of Theology at the University of Notre Dame. With that, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, I forgot to add that uh, because it seems like if I emerged in 2018, <laughs> so I worked as a journalist a uh, decade okay. before, yeah, and my first ed education was in science, not in humanities. Uh, so uh, and my master was about uh, the quality of mayonnaise. So I think it was my major contribution to humanity. Uh, so uh, I'm a, a, in a bit strange situation because I, uh, when I saw the list of the panelists, so I wrote my first phrase, since I have a privilege of speaking first, so, <laughs> but I'm my not apologies. first. So, uh, but I would like to offer. Um, I think it will be valuable still. So, I would like to offer uh, some context for our discussion by sharing some factors and data and stressing a few points uh, representing the dynamics of religious freedom in Ukraine, as reflected in our panel's title. Ukraine's religious landscape is a product of its complex past. Throughout history, Ukrainian ethnic lands have been united under one political entity uh, or fragmented under the rule of several, often with a vastly different political regimes. This resulted in not only regional variations uh, on the religious map, but also created differences within the same religious traditions. This diversity arose under conditions were uh, far removed from our modern concept of religious freedom and uh, the well-known principle, principle of uh, cuius regio, eius religio often held sway. However, this pales in comparison uh, to upheavals that followed. Uh, in the 1920s, uh, central and eastern Ukraine fell under the communist rule. After the uh, World War II, the same fate befell Western Ukraine, bringing the entire territory of modern Ukraine under the Soviet control. The Soviet government, initially intent on suppressing religion entirely, uh, adopted, uh, but adop adopted during the Second World War a more pragmatic approach, which uh, Stephen Merritt aptly uh, termed as concordat between Stalin and the Russian Orthodox Church. This involved keeping religious life tightly controlled and uh, using religious organizations for the regime's political and geopolitical aims. In practice, this meant the destruction of religious organizations deemed dangerous by the government. This included Ukrainian Orthodox communities seeking independence from Moscow because this move 
for the autocephaly didn't start in uh, the late 20th century. It started decades before or even centuries. Um, so uh, this included Ukrainian Orthodox communities seeking independence from Moscow and the Greek Catholic Church. Protestants and other faiths were also targeted. Some, like Greek Catholics and a part of Baptist community, went underground, while Muslim Crimean Tatars, for example, were simply deported by Soviet authorities to other regions of USSR. Those religious organizations that existed legally were controlled from the outside and within. Today, we are only beginning to understand the extent of this control. Uh, unlike Russia or Belarus, Ukraine has opened access to the KGB archives, including agent files. For a chilling example, at the 1946 Pseudo Council orchestrated by the secret services to eliminate Greek Catholic Church in the region of Galicia, all the Russian Orthodox bishops and Greek Catholic priests who presided over it were KGB agents. In fact, of the 225 participants in this event, 144 were recruited by Soviet secret service, so 63%. Among lay representatives, the number was even higher. While the 1946 Pseudo Council stands out for its scale, the practice on inf of infiltrating religious communities and recruiting agents within them continued throughout the Soviet era. It is essential to know, that to know the Ukrainian diaspora here. Unlike their brothers and sisters in Soviet homeland, they lived in a countries with a high level of religious freedom mainly in the United States and Canada. Here, religious communities, primarily Orthodox and Greek Catholic, learned to coexist within the Ukrainian community with mutual respect. Importantly, prominent figures and political thinkers in the Ukrainian diaspora who never stopped dreaming of an independent Ukraine agreed that religious freedom should become one of the cornerstones, cornerstones of a healthy state and society after the independence. Of course, one should not exaggerate, uh, exaggerate the significance of these considerations as they were not directly tra transferred to Ukrainian soil after the 1991. However, these ideas were assimilated by many diaspora representatives who participated in the religious revival in Ukraine after the collapse of the communism. This process of religious revival, which gained considerable momentum about two years before the fall of Soviet totalitarianism, made religious freedom one of the central issues in Soviet Ukraine. To a certain extent, religious freedom became synonymous with a political freedom, and one public action was often dedicated to both demands simultaneously. Suppressed religious groups reemerged to challenge the framework of religious life established by the Soviet government. This process did not go smoothly and was often accompanied by conflicts. Uh, Soviet propaganda presented to the West that this process would lead to the bloodshed in Ukraine to in order to discredit those religious communities that sought the right to exist legally. In fact, the conflict were not the result of a desire for religious freedom, but rather the lack of it in the USSR, and the desire of Soviet authorities to suppress unwanted religious communities and ban their existence. It was the regime's policy that caused the situation, not religious communities. Here is my first point. In the Soviet Union, if the Soviet Union had not suppressed religious freedom, there would, be, there would have been no religious conflicts in Ukraine in the 90s. Thus, religious freedom wasn't a concept to be actively implemented by the newly independent Ukrainian authorities, but a pre-existent reality that had to, be, that had, uh, to navigate. The final years of Soviet rule had witnessed an explosion of religious diversity. The new state faced, uh, faced with this reality had little choice but to acknowledge it. 
Consequently, Ukraine boasts some of the most liberal religious legislations regarding religious organization in, a, in the entire post-Soviet space. However, navigating this newfound freedom wasn't without challenges. The legacy of totalitarian thinking persisted even after the regime fell, with some authorities attempting to manipulate religious communities for political gain. Furthermore, not all religious communities were accustomed to or entirely comfortable, comfortable with operating in a competitive, com competitive environment. Nevertheless, the Ukrainian religious landscape had, has balanced over the last 20 years since independence, uh, and the value of religious freedom has begun to be recognized by all. And here is my second point. In Ukraine, religious organizations acted as initiators and main defenders of religious freedom in Ukraine, not the government. My third point is that religious freedom has been one of the factors that helped Ukraine to deal more effectively with remnants of its totalitarian past. Ukraine would have become a second Belarus, but when the government tried to enlist the support of some or uh, all religious organizations to establish an authoritarian form of government in Ukraine, it was met with a resistance from religious communities that felt that partnership with the government was preferable to subordination. Even if some religious leaders sympathized with Russian or Belarusian model, representatives One minute. Of, one minute. Sorry. Wow. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. So there, uh, there was an information about the occupied territories. I will give you just a few numbers, maybe, a few, few, few data. So uh, in the late 80s, uh, so there were just 5,000 registered religious communities. On the eve of the Russian invasion, there were already 35,000 of religious communities. So in Crimea, before the annexation, there were 2,220 religious organizations representing 43 religious denominations. In 2020, there were only 900. So the number of religious organizations huffed in Crimea. The same happened in Donbass. And now a few words about the um, uh, you have other seven seconds. Okay, so <laughs> yeah, I, I would like to talk about later. later. Yeah, about the Holy Rus and about uh, what was presented before, because it's very, very sensitive question, of course. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> Next, we have Commissioner Nori Turkel. Nuri Zhukal is an attorney and policy expert special, specializing in business and human rights, regulatory compliance, and national security issues. Turkel is the inaugural recipient of the Religious Liberty Prize and serves on the advisory board of RLI. He is a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute and a life member of the Council on Foreign Relations. Turkel is a former chairman of the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, Turkel is an award-winning author of the No Escape, The True Story of China's Genocide of the Uyghurs. Thank you. Thank you, Sama, for that uh, kind introduction. I'm so glad to be back in, um, at uh, Notre Dame. I have um, been a fortunate and lucky to be a member of the Notre Dame family, thanks to this wonderful leader, um, Dean Cole and Professor Barclay. Uh, three years ago, they decided to uh, spotlight the mass atrocities committed against the Uyghur people by recognizing my work and brought me here, hosted a book launch in London and here, and um, essentially funding my uh, public speaking around the world. Um, I, I wanted to thank you, uh, Dean Cole and Professor Barclay. Um, I, I, I wanted to also mention, um, in the spirit of what we're discussing, what you have done uh, for my community um, brought some really positive outcome. Since June 2021, we accomplished um, a lot in Washington, uh, including to pass laws, uh, executive actions by both previous administration that Sama served and the current administration. Even though the, uh, the genocide is still underway, 
uh, we accomplished a lot. And also I wanted to acknowledge uh, my former colleagues at USURF, uh, Elizabeth and Luke. Um, we always represent USURF as commissioners, but the real heroes are them. Uh, they are the people who make us uh, look good and sound smart in public. Thank you. I, you heard Luke presenting yesterday. Um, uh, why um, being uh, on this panel, um, some of you may know that um, I've been sanctioned by Russia in addition to China for my work uh, on behalf of the Ukrainian people on religious freedom issues, human rights issues, and also on broader national security aspect of um, U.S. relationship and, and the European relationship with uh, Ukraine and Russia writ large. Um, as been uh, discussed uh, by the previous panelists, um, the religious freedom condition in Ukraine um, uh, uh, have shown some devastating consequences, uh, both um, in 80% of the territory uh, controlled by the Ukrainian government and the 20% of the occupied territories controlled by Putin's Russia. Uh, two specific groups on occupied territories, uh, the, the Tatars and Jehovah's Witnesses, have been a primary target. Uh, since 2014, uh, uh, since Putin's occupation of Crimea, the religious freedom condition in that part of Ukraine has been uh, uh, shown some devastating uh, uh, aspects. Um, and also the Jehovah's Witnesses in both um, uh, prior to the war uh, and, and after the war has been eluded as part of the broader religious freedom issues have been also deteriorating. Um, and I, I don't want to develop too much on the uh, draft law uh, that you've been discussing. I understand that um, uh, some of us in this panel uh, support that. Uh, during my time at USERF, uh, we raised concern about that uh, draft law. That has uh, that will have a chilling effect. Um, through my uh, engagement with various government officials, both private and official capacity in the past, one common thing that I always hear uh, is a security concern. Uh, this goes all the way from China all to Europe and pretty much everywhere that you raise uh, some draconian uh, religious laws or regulations. They always say, "Oh, this is part of our national security concern." In the case of Ukraine, it is understandable, and the case of the OCU, but um, uh, that kind of blanket ban, um, in the case in some, uh, some of those communities already switched their position uh, in support of the Ukrainian government, uh, is something that needs to be taken into consideration. I personally think that every time, whenever a government uses a security concern as a pretext to restrict religious freedom, uh, eventually very problematic. Um, on the um, uh, the responses, you know, I, I don't want to talk too much about uh, the actual uh, happenings, you know, the U.S. government's 2023 report and the fact sheet and, and public information that USERF have put out uh, shows that there's a deterioration of uh, religious freedom condition in uh, Ukraine and the Russia-controlled uh, areas. For example, um, there are 500 religious sites have been damaged and destroyed. As staggering statistics shows that uh, there's an uh, erasure of uh, European culture, uh, Ukrainian culture heritage is underway. Um, and and the, the United States and the like-minded governments um, need to pay a particularly uh, close attention to some of the key aspects of our relationship with um, um, both Ukraine and Russia. One, um, I'm a big proponent of sanctions, um, uh, economic sanctions. That is the type of language that authoritarian regime, uh, whether it be the one in Tehran or uh, Beijing or Moscow, uh, pays particular attention to. So I'd like to see the United States government uh, picking up on the factual finding, annual reports, to work with like-minded governments to impose uh, coordinated sanctions. Um, for religious freedom violations in uh, Russian-occupied territories. And I'm very pleased that as, as State Department has been designating Russia as a country of particular concern. Um, that recognition needs to be followed with the real actions. I know in a diplomacy it's very difficult uh, to get everybody on, uh, on the same page, 
but this is one area uh, that the United States government could make uh, a, a progress, specifically focusing on uh, religious freedom and cultural identity issues that it's very important for the Ukrainian people to preserve not only their democratic freedom, not only their sovereignty, but also cultural heritage. Um, I also would like to see uh, the uh, United States government uh, leading an effort to advocate for UN Human Rights Council to organize a special session to investigate religious freedom violations on occupied territories. Uh, and also, uh, as I noted, uh, the sanctions can be very effective. I've seen it in the case of China when we brought in Canadian, UK, and European allies on the same page to impose sanction uh, that hurt uh, their economic. And now, specifically now, uh, everybody knows that uh, uh, China has helped to rebuild uh, uh, Russian uh, military. And that is hampering the efforts to end this war. So uh, with that incentive, with that understanding, I think the international community has even more, uh, uh, should have a, a more reason, a more compelling reason to uh, take uh, some bold actions. Um, and then uh, finally, the United States government um, uh, should prioritize uh, the aid programs to rebuild uh, destroyed places of worship uh, and provide pastoral care to those affected by the war. And also, um, and some of you have, have seen, um, uh, some of you who have worked with me uh, understand that I, I, I work in the interface community and I, I genuinely believe the power of interface community, interface dialogue. Uh, and we need to use international organizations such as OSCE uh, and the US government agencies to uh, promote uh, interface dialogue to uh, bring the country back to where it was. I, I, I not, I'm not Ukrainian, but I know a little bit of Ukrainian history because of the, the Uyghur Tatar connection. We have a cultural, uh, linguistic, historical ties. I essentially speak Tatar language, the Uyghur can be. So I, I always been using uh, the religious tolerance, uh, uh, interface dialogue and support as a kind of showcase to promote that kind of um, uh, alliance between different eight faith group, but that has been somewhat um, uh, destroyed, uh, specifically since the war. So we can use a government means uh, to, to advance or promote that specific um, um, aspect. I think that will uh, do it for me now. Okay. So I've been Ooh, very great. <laughs> So I was thinking of asking, a, posing a question uh, as a start question, but I actually would like to uh, take a personal advantage of being the moderator and share some reflections after, uh, after this panel and after yesterday. Um, as Nuri mentioned, I served at USAID. I was the chief advisor for international religious freedom uh, during the Trump administration. My first portfolio when I showed up was a very easy one, which was helping the persecuted Christians and Yazidis in northern Iraq and Syria. As a Muslim myself, who grew up in the Middle East and was born in the Middle East, I was honored and privileged to, one, serve the United States, two, serve the American people, uh, and make sure that the story and my faith is not defined by ISIS actions. The mosaic of the Middle East means so much to me and to my children that it's important to protect its historical religious coexistence between the, the, the three Abrahamic religions. Sorry. And I, I work from a very strong conviction, uh, despite the fact that in every meeting, in every effort, my faith was seen as the evil faith. But it was my personal duty to change that perspective. And I was very blessed to have incredible people from other faiths that gave me that validation. So when I, was, when I was asked to moderate this panel, 
I hesitated because I don't know that much about Ukraine. But I was intrigued by the fact that for the first time, it wasn't Muslims that were eating Christians. And I thought about Notre Dame of the idea of asking a Muslim to moderate a panel where it's a Christian challenges between churches in different communities in a different setup. When I was studying and learning more about Ukraine's history and the challenges that they have, I was struck with the same exact situations that your people are going through in terms of challenges to religious freedom. It's the same thing, again, the church, we see it in Nicaragua, we see it in Nigeria, we, saw, we see it with the Uyghurs, we see it in the Rohingya. And the story keeps going on. And in this conference, there were so many stories this, this week. Dean Cole talked about, mentioned two stories, shared two stories with us yesterday at the dinner. And then I was just overwhelmed with the story of Mr. and Mrs. Maroon and the way that they spoke about their faith and taking care of people that belong to my faith. And I, I'm still trying to process all that um, because it's been an incredible, incredible time. And I, don't know what the answer is, but I'm also incredibly puzzled and in a, in a good way of the way that you spoke today about the religious freedom of all of your communities in Ukraine. Uh, you talked about everyone. You've, you, everybody has been, is considered a citizen of Ukraine. So, I wanted to highlight this because this is an incredible example, despite of the fact that it's the same threats and challenges that communities of faith face everywhere. It's just a different story. It's a, it's a regime, it's an aggression, it's non-state, it's a state. The end results, people do not enjoy freedom. And um, it's, it's just remarkable. And with that, I'm gonna, stop talking and open the floor for uh, questions. Yes. Thank you. Um, two weeks before the um, Grand Chamber of the European Court of Human Rights has delivered its judgment in the interstate application Ukraine versus Russia about Crimea uh, violations, alleged violations. The judgment was uh, unanimous. Uh, found violation for several uh, rights and freedoms guaranteed by the European Convention of Human Rights. And since I was a member of the composition, just to uh, quote what the court said about violation uh, on freedom of religion. Then I quote the court, the European Court of Human Rights, found violation of religious freedom due to harassment and intimidation of religious leaders who do not adhere to the Russian Orthodox faith, arbitrary sources of place of worship, and confiscation of religious property. There are still three pending interstate applications from Ukraine uh, versus Russia about now the facts after 2022. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes. Falling upon the mercy of the gracious chair, I'm going to commit the cardinal sin of making a comment, not asking a question. And that is that what's been obvious from here is the instrumentalization of religion and religious communities, creating the illusion of power through political affiliation, coming from a church that has lived that for centuries, um, first being totally dismissed and then being instrumentalized at times but thankfully never being a political power and being able to push back. It just shows that religion and faith are instrumentalized and used mm. because they matter. Because faith is incredibly powerful as an advocate, 
but incredibly powerful as an adversary. And that's when we stand together and we speak here, and that makes that perfectly reasonable. Um, what it also does is it creates this reciprocal demonization that is inflicted upon us, but that we can fight against. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. I didn't see her. Thank you. <laughs> Good morning. I want to say thank you so much for all the information you have given. My question is uh, towards Nuri. If you can, um, I'll put you on the spot. Sorry. I'm doing the whole Muslim Muslim thing. So. <laughs> um, I want to know what USERF has put together um, from the years of the work that has been doing for so long in religious freedom work in connection to the history of religious freedom violations. And I say that because I know that USERF recommends their report to the State Department and that those are just recommendations. But we've seen this happen before. And I say that as a person who came to this country as a child refugee from Afghanistan and Russia pushed my family out and we were one of the lucky ones to come to the US and I was a very small child. But my father actually, um, it, we're ethnically Uzbek and he was forced out of Samarkand in the 1920s by the Russians, so he actually escaped uh, and became refugee twice by the Soviet Union. And so there's a hundred years of reference that we've had so far. What has the USERV done so far in terms of collecting that information and using it as a tool to go forward instead of waiting for countries that are oppressive like Russia to do this again over and over and over again? Thank you. Thank you. Um, that's an interesting question, also a somewhat relevant question to my own history. Um, the Uyghurs have had um, in an independent state up until 1949 uh, when, uh, uh, when Stalin decided to destroy it and give it to um, Mao's China. So um, culturally, historically, I share that sentiment. Uh, as for USERF's work, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a whole package. We look at, you know, I'm no longer in the commission, but I, from my uh, four years with the commission, I know that we look at open source information, we look at uh, media reports, we looked at the historical facts, we also talked to actual human beings, the victims and experts, um, and hold hearings, and package them together and make a recommendation. Making recommendations is one piece, but uh, we oftentimes don't get what we want. Um, I've been in publicly, uh, you know, uh, criticizing um, both previous and current administration, not following our recommendation on CPC designation, special watch designation. Uh, case in point, India uh, uh, arguably has the largest Muslim population, and in Mahatma Gandhi's India, there's an active atrocity crimes being committed, and Nigeria is another case. And in these two countries, we often, I personally, um, uh, in, in public space, uh, media, public speaking, criticize the U.S. government for not following through the recommendations. So we look at a variety of factors. Am I right, Elizabeth? Okay. So getting Elizabeth's nod is, is important. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? Yes. We've spoken the last couple of days about religious dialogue. I'm not from a Christian faith, it's quite obvious. So I'm just gonna ask members of the panel, how would you advise somebody like myself who has 30 years in dialogue with communities around the world to interact with the Russian Orthodox Church and Patriarch Kirill, given his proximity to Vladimir Putin? So hard question to answer. Uh, from my, my perspective, from my uh, experience, I had a number of uh, different conversations with uh, Moscow Patriarchate officials, not with Kirill Gundayev himself, but I had meetings with all major figures around him. And uh, one big impression, uh, almost 15 years, uh, before uh, when he, as a Russian patriarch, uh, first time visited Kyiv in 2009. And uh, 
his minister on, of, of foreign affairs of the Russian Orthodox Church at that time, Metropolitan Hilary Nolfeyev, requested to have a private meeting with representatives of Ukrainian church to exchange uh, some information. Uh, we had one hour conversation. And from this conversation, I uh, have two major points. First, he uh, asked me to uh, bring to attention of our primate that Moscow proposed, if you will return to Russian Orthodox Church, we will return to you all your ranks, uh, position, etc. It's, it's a proof that for Russian Orthodox Church, it's no matter of canonicity, uh, uh, faith itself, only one thing uh, uh, is matter is a subordination, ju jurisdiction and uh, following of the uh, orders from above. And other, uh, my impression, I told him, you know, your eminence, that uh, all conflicts sooner or later resolved by peaceful negotiations. And you can imagine what was his response. Or total elimination of one side. It is a way of their thinking. It is a what about this Russian aggression for? Total elimination of Ukrainian identity, Ukrainian state, Ukrainian church, everything what is Ukrainian before, because for now, we can see that for official ideology of Russian state and Russian church, the uh, very existence of Ukrainian unique nation is a heresy. And how to deal with them? Like with officials, uh, uh, for example, of Nazi regime, if you uh, can able to do something particular, for example, to release some hostages. You can have negotiations with them, and I uh, have bring you examples that two Greek Catholic priests who have been disappeared for two years, been returned to Ukraine in uh, the process of uh, exchanging of prisoners of war from Ukraine to Russia and from Russia to Ukraine. but when you try to reach uh, Pater Kirill himself, you must understand he's official. He's the same like Minister of Foreign Affairs Lavrov or other ministers of Putin's cabinet, just wearing in uh, uh, religious uh, clothes. But first of all, he is official and he uh, uh, do as official, he think as official, and you can deal with him res, uh, just as a as Russian official. Yes. Just add one quick thing. Thank you. I think that's really insightful. Um, I think, in addition to this idea of preconditioning, um, talks on prisoner swaps and other significant pieces of progress. Another um, a, approach might be to also try to reach out to members of the Russian Orthodox Church that don't support the war. There have been many who've been willing to sign petitions or speak out in public, um, even though it means that they're going to jail, and to find ways to amplify their voices, to undermine the idea that Kirill is the only voice for Russia or for the Russian Orthodox Church. Um, I think there's, uh, as you probably know, the chief rabbi in Russia left, as well as Lutheran leaders, because of the pressure that's on religious organizations in Russia to support um, Putin. And between that and sort of the history, I don't think, I agree, I don't think you're going to get anywhere going straight to the top. But I would like to mm -hmm. emphasize in one very fact. Russian Orthodox Church now have almost 
400 bishops around the globe. Not in Russia itself, but everywhere, including the United States. No one bishop of Russian Orthodox Church raised his voice against this aggression. It's a picture that it's not a matter of personality. It's a matter of system. Because this system is not just cooperative with Kremlin regime. It's integrated inside their minds because they really believe that this is a holy war against godless West. It's not a war against Ukraine. This is a war against United States, against Europe, as against democracy itself. And they really believe that they are stronghold of uh, uh, God's law, and they must eliminate everything what is evil, including Ukraine. We'll take two more questions, Dean Cole and Marcella then. Yeah, so the, the, that answer was related to my question for Professor Clark, uh, Dr. Babinski, and you, Metropolitan Zoria. So the descriptions given by Professor Clark and Dr. Babinski uh, suggest that the differences between the Ukrainian Orthodox Church and the, uh, the Orthodox Church of Ukraine are, are about identity rather than doctrine. And uh, despite what the Russian Orthodox Church has articulated, this war is likely to end. It is likely to end with negotiations and with some form of Ukraine to emerge rather than being absorbed by Russia. That being the case, what would it take for a ecumenicalism or reunification of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church and the Orthodox Church of Ukraine to take place? Maybe I will be first. So very thank you for this question uh, about the identity. Uh, yes, we can, we can trace that there are two different Orthodox identities in Ukraine because uh, the Orthodox Church of Ukraine tries to follow I think more Kievan tradition, Kievan oriented tradition, starting from the 17th century metropolitan Peter Mohela and uh, and so on. So uh, and of course we we recognize that there is a distinct Russian Orthodox tradition. The problem is now that uh, with these names, with these titles, because I'm convinced that the religious freedom uh, is also about the right of religious communities to switch their uh, um, um, sub uh, jurisdiction, yeah? Yes, uh, and uh, because uh, I think in, in most cases it goes smoothly, without conflicts. And also religious freedom, I'm convinced, uh, is about truth. That you should inform your parishioners about your church affiliation and your subordination. The problem is now that most of parishioners of Ukrainian Orthodox Church of Moscow Patriarchate in Ukraine don't know that their church is subordinated to the Russian Patriarchate. That's why Ukrainian government, uh, before the war, obliged this church to sign their affiliation on their churches because you have the statistics. You have like 10,000 of religious organization of Ukraine, in Ukraine of Moscow Patriarchate, but only 5% of Ukrainian population affiliate themselves during sociological polls with this church. So th this doesn't matter that only 5% go to these churches of Moscow Patriarchate. There are more, but they don't know that these churches belong to that patriarchate. So I think that this truth is also about religious freedom. This remark. And now, I think that in the future, of course, you know, Ukrainians want peace more than anyone in this world. And I also want to, you know, to, to, to set a peaceful agreement with Russia because I don't want my children to fight another war. 
I have a boy and a girl and I'm, I'm really afraid that this is not the last one. I really want to see a peaceful relations between our, culture, between our cultures and countries, but uh, on equal footage, you know, because we, we want to negotiate with them as a, as a separate nation, as a sovereign state. Uh, so, uh, but we, we want to negotiate it. I think that maybe in the future, there still will be two churches in Ukraine because there are a lot of people that like Russian Orthodox tradition, of course. And I think that they can have a right to attend such churches with a church Slavonic uh, language, uh, in a Russian pronunciation, with uh, icons, with saints, and so on and so forth. But uh, the, the, the another problem is when you implement, so of course, the, the state has no right to, you know, to, to, to decide uh, should this church be independent or not independent or who should receive the communion. Uh, but what to do when a uh, church implement into its religious tradition some political uh, ideas, like the idea of Holy Rus, that it's God's will for Ukraine to be under Russia. So how the state should react? So I think that, yes, we will have, I think it will be like that, that we will have Russian church in Ukraine, but I think that the state uh, can oblige them not to implement political ideas so they can follow this tradition and they, you, you have here in the US, Russian Orthodox churches, Orthodox traditions, uh, with Orthodox uh, Russian, uh, you know, um, heritage heritage. Uh, but, they, but they don't preach in their churches that Alaska is a part of Russia and this is a God's will. Imagine the difference. <laughs> I'm sorry, we, I'm getting the instructions to end because we went over time. Uh, I, please help me thank our panelists for this incredibly good session.